Marvel Studios appears to be taking a 180 degrees shift on how they make films. The Marvel's director recently admitted that female-led films now depend on whether or not the movie's good. If you recall, Kevin Feige previously indicated uh, regarding The Eternals that the reason why that movie was even pushed to the forefront of their list was because of all of the identity politics that they could push in the movie. Now it looks like it really does... Uh, you have to have a good story, a good movie, and you have to get people in seats in order for them to continue to make stories like like the Marvels or like the Eternals, I guess. So first off, we have Nia DaCosta actually admitting that Kevin Feige didn't really like a lot of her ideas. She told Total Film, I'll pitch Kevin Feige 17 versions of what can happen with all these women and why and how and this and that. Uh, and he's like, okay, girl, and sometimes I think I've really got a movie going after this. And then other times I'm like, oh, hey, they have this whole other plan that I'm not a part of. To this end, DeCosta would later explain to the magazine that at this point in time, with Hollywood having taken great strides in representation, the success of female-led films, including the Marvels, was now truly dependent on their quality rather than any inherent messaging. As I told you, they clearly were making movies based on messaging. We have numerous quotes from Victoria Alonso talking about that. She said, if you don't represent, you're leaving money on the table, et cetera, et cetera, saying that is somehow uh, part of their business model as to why they were doing that. And I guess it, it was indeed that with the DEI stuff, but maybe that money is uh, running <laughs> running dry now, or it's not get, they're not getting as much uh, to cover the massive losses that they're having at the box office. Nevertheless, this is what DaCosta said. In terms of women-led films and women as superheroes in particular and excitement around that, I think it's really just about whether or not the movie's good. Especially now we have more and more films that are female-led that are action-based or superhero-based. So very clear there that the, that the success of a film now is whether or not it's actually good, not whether or not it actually includes women or some other uh, minority. Faced with the inevitable topic of Barbie's breakaway box office success, DeConsta declined to compare her film's prospects to those of Margot Robbie's latest outing, as she felt Barbie is so specific, it's Barbie. I probably agree with her. I mean, Barbie is a massive cultural icon, uh, very different, obviously a, uh, w a women's product, a girl's product, whereas uh, the Marvels, I would argue, was actually a, a men's product. They they gender-swapped Marvel in the original Captain Marvel film. Uh, they made Annette Benning's character the Supreme Intelligence as well. Uh, we're getting a gender-swapped villain in this upcoming The Marvels film. So very different. They're taking, I would argue, what is a boys product uh, that used to be aimed at boys and trying to turn it into a women's product uh, with Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, etc., uh, Kamala Khan, and um, <clears throat> I don't even know what they're calling her. Um, I, she's, she was originally Captain Marvel, um, Monica Rambeau. Uh, Takasu goes on and says, Every girl in the world pretty much probably had a Barbie and a lot of men. So I think that's a phenomenon that's probably going to make a billion dollars. So, yeah, she's making the same point that I just made. So I, I, I do agree with her uh, on that aspect. Uh, as the interview drew to a close, DaCosta ultimately admitted that rather than look to Barbie as a blueprint for success, she believed that for women-led superhero films, as long as the quality stays up, that's going to keep the audience coming back. Unfortunately, Marvel Studios does not have a track record of quality anymore. They have a track record of poor uh, quality films. Uh, not high quality. They're not getting people wanting to go back. Uh, obviously, Guardians of the Galaxy did worse than, I think, the first and second movie. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. We obviously have the Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania losing money. Numerous people have been um, deriding the quality of the product, where, whether or not that's Thor, Love and Thunder, Doctor Strange, and the Multiverse of Madness, and whether or not those films have actually made money. Uh <laughs> It <laughs> seemingly changes by the month when we get new reports coming out about how much they spent on those films. Uh, they might have made close to a billion dollars or at least over 800 million worldwide. But the fact that they have like absolutely insane budgets means that they might actually have lost money on some of those films that were making a lot of money at the box office. But as we've seen, there has been uh, a steady decline. Like I said, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 did not have as many people going to see that film as we saw in the first one and the second one. Um, asked her in the same interview if she could speak to what makes her film stand out from all the MCU outings that came before it. The director asserted the biggest difference from the other MCU movies to date is that it's really wacky and silly. The worlds we go to in this movie are worlds unlike others you've seen in the MCU. Bright worlds that you haven't seen before. That just seems utterly ridiculous. Talked about this before. She's definitely uh, talked about... Um, we, we've seen 
plenty of wacky and silly, and I think people are, are done with it. Thor Love and Thunder, perfect excuse. Uh, I think that was kind of ushered in by James Gunn in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. You had a little bit of it, I guess, in Avengers Age of Ultron uh, with Joss Whedon and kind of, kind of that aspect to it. And I think people are just kind of over the type of Marvel humor that's constantly interfering with the drama, with the tension. They undercut these dramatic moments with these dumb, stupid jokes. And it really just kind of pulls you out of the immersion of the actual the drama, the movie that they're trying to present, the story that they're trying to present. So uh, it does seem like there is a shift here. We're seeing this not only from Marvel Studios. We're seeing multiple DC directors saying that they're... Not just females, not just minorities. We obviously we had Shazam, Fury of the Gods. We had um, uh, not Zachary Levi, but the director of the film uh, state that the success, uh, future stories for uh, Shazam depended on the box office success. We've had that from Jolo Maraduena when it comes to uh, Blue Beetle. It depends on the box office, and it does look like we're seeing producers, studio hands now saying, "Hey." We have to focus on return on investment. We have to focus on profits. Are we actually making money? Is this what people want? It does seem like there is a little bit of a shift there. Obviously, I think that it's going to take a long time before we get a real shift into that matter because we're still getting um, these films marketed based on identity politics, Blue Beetle being the obvious example. I think we're seeing some of that being marketed as well with the Marvels. Obviously, intersectional feminism is still inherent in that movie, and I think we've seen some of the early promotion indicates that as well. But let me know what you think. Do you think we're actually getting a shift in how... Uh, these studios determine whether or not they uh, continue to make these films. Are they actually going to focus on a good story and box office returns? Or will they still focus on their DEI investment to fund the narrative that they want to push?